thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Very nice to be back with you. A few familiar faces, some who have stayed the course, but whether that was after Ian Montgomery's uh, words last week, which said if you enjoyed it, come back. If you didn't enjoy it, sure they might get better. Uh, I don't know, but uh, hopefully uh, a few of you will stick with us through the, the whole series. Um, Last week, when I was talking about the Ulster Volunteer Force, I was talking about a movement which it's thought had somewhere between 100 and 110,000 members. The movement I'm talking about tonight, the Young Citizen Volunteers, was a much smaller organisation. Probably only about 900 members at the, the outside. So much smaller, and you might then wonder why uh, it gets a full hour. Well, the Young Citizen Volunteers... Um, <coughs> tells quite a lot about Ireland in the period before the First World War. It tells us something about uh, municipalism, uh, such as that exists in, in Ireland, something about the role of Ireland in the under of military tradition in Britain, which Ian Beckett has written extensively about, and I mentioned briefly last week, and something about the organised youth movements in Ireland, uh, where they were, were seen to be uh, politically. So there's a number of different uh, areas that we can look at connected to the Young Citizen Volunteers. I should start off by saying that the Young Citizen Volunteers of Ireland, as formed in 1912, had uh, nothing really to do uh, with the, we could even argue the Young Citizen Volunteers of late 1914, certainly nothing to do with the paramilitary organisation of the 1970s that takes the name. As originally formed, the Young Citizen Volunteers of Ireland, and the Young Citizen Volunteers of Ireland, not of Ulster or of Belfast, was formed as a non-political and non-sectarian force. So a far cry in September 1912 of what they were to become by June 1914, uh, much less how the name is, is used later on. In 1914, the Young Citizen Volunteers essentially do become part of the Ulster Volunteer Force. That's a reflection of the political views of most of its members, the changing dynamics of the third home rule crisis, but also a reflection of the failure of the original Young Citizen Volunteers idea. To put it fairly bluntly, the original Young Citizens Volunteer movement was essentially bankrupt by early 1914, and that was certainly one incentive to merge with the larger Ulster Volunteer Force. Uh, another major problem was they failed to get what was called recognition from the British government, so they hadn't been taken on as a territorial force unit, which was one of the original uh, hopes behind the Young Citizen Volunteers. We can also say that in financial terms, the city of Belfast had probably not supported them to the extent that had been hoped. Uh, the city corporation had provided the use of the markets in George's Market for drill purposes, occasional use of the Ulster Hall for concerts, but hadn't really provided hard cash and there was also no municipal recognition in that sense. So really the original ideas had uh, proved to be problematic by early 14 and that tells us a lot about the incorporation of the Young Citizen Volunteers in the Ulster Volunteer Force. A battalion of the 36th Ulster Division was formed on the nucleus of the Young Citizen Volunteers. This became the 14th Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles. But it also incorporated middle class recruits who enlisted uh, from a number of uh, sources, but in many cases from the stillborn sports and university battalions. There was an attempt to form both of these units in the Ulster Division of September 1914, which didn't come to fruition for various reasons. And the 14th Rifles was also a popular outlet for Southern Unionists and for those from Great Britain who were sympathetic to the Ulster Unionist cause. There is an argument to be made that the 14th Royal Irish Rifles is one of the closest things you get in Ireland to the so-called PALS battalions that are formed in, in England and Scotland in uh, September, October 1914 that bring in um, essentially middle class groups to the British Army where they serve together um, and that's something we would certainly look into as well. So to start off in terms of the formation of the Young Citizen Volunteers, there were a series of preliminary meetings held uh, involving the Lord Mayor of Belfast over May and June 1912. And those meetings involved a number of the great and the good of Belfast society. Um, some names familiar, some not so familiar. Uh, Major Fred Crawford, uh, of course the future gun runner and uh, a, a major industrialist in the city, an industrial chemist. Uh, was involved, uh, so that's one obvious name that you'll uh, remember from last week, but a few others, uh, Lieutenant Colonel McCallum, who commanded the 3rd Royal Irish Rifles, uh, Major <coughs> F.A. Cunningham, a solicitor and militia officer, 
Uh, Liam McVicker, who is the managing director of Campbell and Cochrane, uh, the area that uh, water manufacturers, and a number of others that will be more or less familiar to you. Another big name that I should mention is Frank Martin of the Work of the Clark Shipyard, who is, is a very important uh, person within the Young Citizen Volunteers and indeed underwrites the movement financially, along with the then Lord Mayor R.J. McMorty. There were early hopes that Lord Shaftesbury, who at that time owned Belfast Castle, was Colonel of the North Irish Horse and was Chancellor of Queen's University Belfast, would become involved in the Young Citizen Volunteers as their President, but that doesn't seem to have uh, really gone anywhere. There's no correspondence from Shaftesbury about why he wasn't prepared to take up the role. So McMorty, the Lord Mayor, becomes President. Um, and I'll say a bit more about the commanding officer later on. There was some nationalist involvement in the original committee, but the, the most notable name is Francis J. Baker, uh, a rather eccentric antiquarian who, amongst other things, uh, put up the uh, what's claimed to be the, the tomb to St. Patrick at Down uh, Cathedral, uh, but not from the mainstream of nationalist thought, certainly in the city itself. Press reports of the 6th of June 1912 spoke of the idea of the Young Citizen Volunteers and where the, the Lord Mayor's vision was going, and more particularly the vision of a man called F.T. Geddes. Geddes outlined this scheme, saying that some effort should be made to form a non-political and non-sectarian organisation, having for its objects the development of a manly physique by means of modified military and police drill. Um, an idea here, of course, that militarism was quite a good thing. Conscription, as we said last week, <coughs> was uh, almost uniform throughout the continent of Europe. So these ideas of, of police drill leading to uh, exercise and so on were, were seen as a, a good thing. There's then other ideas that Gettys puts forward. The idea that this movement would develop a spirit of responsible citizenship uh, is one. There's an idea of lectures and civic matters size of the population of the town and city, public boards, its functions and so on. There's then an idea of the development of physique, military, police drill, free gymnastics, bayonet exercise, baton exercise, swimming, all this sort of thing. A few military ideas, drill, signalling, uh, and ambulance work. So there's a number of different ideas that come together in the original concept of the Young Citizen Volunteers as fluid in June 1912. The constitution of the Young Citizen Volunteers made this non-political nature of the force even more explicit. Bylaw 6, sorry this is timed out already on me, um, stated, Members shall not as such take part in any political meeting or demonstration, nor shall they wear the uniform of the corps if attending any political meeting. So a real desire to keep the movement separated from politics. At the time that that was seen as slightly problematic, uh, a Reverend W.S. Kerr wrote to the Northern Wake and expressed some concerns about how the Young Citizen Volunteers would actually maintain this non-political attitude. He said that it seemed to him that it was going to be under the control of Belfast Corporation. Of course, that stage, a uh, uh, unionist dominated uh, corporation, and he seems then to have thought that this would basically become a unionist body, whatever the words of a non political uh, rhetoric were used. Despite numerous approaches, there was no official government support. I wanted to talk about that later. Uh, at the very start, there were attempts to get the government uh, either to recognise the movement or at least to provide obsolete rifles for drill. That uh, doesn't seem to go anywhere at all. And as I said, Belfast Corporation made certain facilities available to the movement but didn't provide any hard cash uh, as far as we can work out. At the start, the Finance Committee of the Young Citizen Volunteers uh, asked members of the council to make private approaches to gentlemen who they thought were likely to subscribe funds. Um, so it's all done in a sort of gentlemanly club type atmosphere. There, there's nothing as vulgar as a circular at the start of the movement, though as we'll see that does come in uh, fairly quickly. So the actual inaugural meeting is a public meeting is held for the Young Citizen Volunteers on the 10th of September 1912 in Belfast City Hall. The first formal meeting of the Council of the Young Citizen Volunteers, its governing body, was then held on the 16th of September 1912, and the first public meeting for recruiting purposes held in the Ulster Hall on the 23rd of September 1912. So within that sort of short space of uh, two weeks, the, the movement goes from inauguration to first recruits. Now somewhat unfortunately for the uh, movement and how it develops, um, I'll just put up a, a slide there, it's a bit different. Um, it's somewhat unfortunate for the movement as it develops that the 
the month that it's formed, there's a comic, op comic opera on at the Grand Opera House, which is P.M. Farley's production of the comic opera The Chocolate Soldier. And this seems to be the reason why the Young Citizen Volunteers end up being nicknamed The Chocolate Soldier <laughs> uh, during the First World War. So uh, that's rather unfortunate that those two are coincidental. I'll turn now to talk about where this fits in within the British amateur military tradition and Ireland. Um, this was something that I briefly alluded to last week, but one of the, the things that the Young Citizen Volunteers are trying to do is to tap into this tradition, which really had extended in a fairly patchwork way to Ireland. Um, if we go back to 1859, where I think we can sensibly start uh, a discussion on the, the amateur units, uh, there was an invasion scare for Britain at that point um, from the French. Um, it always comes back to the French, as we see in this week's news. Um, and <coughs> rifle volunteer units were formed in uh, Great Britain, originally middle class, but fairly soon giving over to skilled working class for, for the bulk of the recruits. Um, many of these posh middle class units carried on until the Great War, many operating with elements of the Gentlemen's Club. So uh, members would uh, pay entrance fees, there would be annual subscriptions, there would be uniform subscriptions. The most extreme example of these gentlemanly units is a unit that's still with us today, the Honourable Artillery Company, where for a man to become a member of that, he had to be proposed and seconded by two existing members of the Corps, be approved at a meeting of the unit as a whole, and then pay a £2 entrance fee and £1 a year. And if we're thinking in terms of where inflation's gone uh, since 1912, 1913, £2 in 19... Uh, 13, we can estimate as being worth about £300 today. So men were actually paying quite substantial sums to be involved in some of these class core units of the territorial force right up until uh, the First World War. There are other famous examples that, that you may know of, the Artist Rifles, the London Rifle Brigade, the London Scottish. Many of the volunteer units that were formed in the 1850s, right up to the First World War, continued to wear grey uniforms, and that's what we, we have a young citizen volunteer in the grey uniform there, George uh, Hackney, in grey with blue, uh, light blue facings, and then just below that, uh, if I can move my slides, this is a few of the units of the London Regiment of the Territorial Force, uh, the one in the middle is the Civil Service Rifles. So the uniform, I, I always thought when I was younger looking at this that it was a very strange choice for a, a unit that essentially became Unionist to choose Confederate Grey as their the uniform, but it, it is because of this link to the volunteer rifle movement in Britain. And of course what was happening in the 1850s and what volunteer rifle units were continuing to do in Britain up to the First World War was to show that they were different from the regular army. So they weren't wearing red, blue or green of the regulars, they were wearing this very distinctive grey. There's indeed an entire brigade of the London Regiment, the so-called Iron Brigade, that, that made a point of, of keeping these grey uniforms and appearing in them in public. So there's that inspiration for the Young Citizen Volunteers. There's also a class corps that wears, wears grey in London, or sorry, in Glasgow, the 5th Scottish Rifles, and the principal of the Municipal Technical College in Belfast has, as far as I can work out, served in the ranks of that unit, so I think that may be the more direct uh, inspiration. Various attempts were made to develop the British Rifle Volunteer Movement in Ireland, but the legislation was never passed to do so. The British government was essentially rather concerned about arming Irishmen, um, particularly if we think of the, the synergies of this. 1858 is when the Fenian Movement really uh, starts to take a hold in Ireland and become a mass movement. 1859 is the birth of the Rifle Volunteer Movement, so you can't see where the concerns were about where doing out rifles to uh, anyone and everyone in Ireland would be a problem. What we do get in Ireland though in the 1850s is the militia and the militia is reformed in England and Wales in 1852 but it's established in Ireland and in Scotland in 1854 essentially in the context at that time of the Crimean War. What was different there was the militia tended to draw on underemployed rural labourers for most of its manpower had a firmer connection to the regular army and would only meet up for a three week annual camp each year. So there seemed to be a view that Irishmen could go into these units because they would be better controlled and better disciplined than the regular army rather than the volunteer movements which in, in the British case uh, didn't have particularly firm links with the regulars until the 1880s. So that seems to be the, the thinking there. The outbreak of the South African War in 1899 saw the reformation of the Yeomanry in Ireland. 
Uh, there have been a, a large Yeomanry force in Ireland, about 40,000 strong, between 1786 and 1834. But I've been wound up in 1834 by a Whig government due to its perceived Orangeism and hardline Toryism. So while Yeomanry units had existed in uh, Great Britain continuously from the 1790s up until uh, the First World War, we get this distinct break in Ireland, and it's only with the uh, South African War that that's, uh, that's changed. The units that are formed for the South African War are later the, the, the founders, essentially, of the north of Ireland, Imperial Yeomanry, and the south of Ireland, Imperial Yeomanry, which in 1908 become renamed the North Irish Horse and the South Irish Horse. They involved fairly small numbers of men, but they were important in that they brought in middle class men and farmers. So the sort of people that went into the rifle volunteers in Yeomanry in Britain were then being accommodated in these Yeomanry units in uh, Ireland. So the situation in the under military units was very different in Ireland to Britain. And a number of people in Ireland thought that this would change with the so-called Haldon reforms of 1906 to 1908, which was meant to bring in a more uniform uh, military system to Britain, to bring in ideas of a second line and allow for reinforcement in time of war. One of the big differences that came in with the Haldon reforms was that the old volunteer units, yeomanry units, were put into brigades and logistical units were set up, engineer units, artillery units, so you did get something that looked very much like a second line army. But there were a number of compromises in that. The territorial force as set up in 1908 was only for home service and would have no rule in aid of the civil power, which we will see is quite important. That's one thing that comes up with the young citizen volunteers. Um, Halton, Secretary of State for War, thought that if war broke out, the territorials would mobilise and would train for about six months before they would be asked to, to go overseas or to draft men overseas. So what, what's originally envisaged in the Halton reforms is quite a modest measure. Parts of it are, are chipped away. But in terms of what goes on in Ireland, um, the Halton scheme isn't extended over as a whole for reasons which still remain unclear. The best excuse that anybody gets out of the, the British government, and there are a number of opinions to MPs that ask about this, is that because the rifle volunteers haven't been set up in Ireland, so the territorials couldn't be set up in Ireland. But we do get some elements of the uh, territorial force that are set up, which are, of course, the officer training corps units. Uh, there are four schools that take on OTC units, uh, of most relevant to what we're looking at. Uh, this evening, Campbell College, and um, there is Queen's University, Belfast, and Trinity College, Dublin, set up OTC units, along with the Royal College of Surgeons and Royal Veterinary College in Dublin. So there are certain aspects of the territorial force that do um, extend over to uh, Ireland, and there's also an idea to extend the National Reserve to Ireland, which is another element of the territorial force. It seems that that, in principle, is accepted all around, but the Treasury refuses to, to fund uh, the cost of a few clerks to enrol former soldiers in it. So one of the reasons why the Young Citizen Volunteers was formed is because Ireland is left out of this whole movement that had been thought that the Holland reforms was a time when Ireland could then have been included much more explicitly within uh, the British uh, military system. Without that, uh, there is resentment. Having said that, um, the British government's decision not to extend the territorial force to Ireland, we can think, uh, did have some sense to it when we look at what happens later on. Would these territorial force units, if they'd been formed in Ireland, have uh, remained the loyal uh, elements of the British army, whatever of course that meant after the current incident of 1914, or would they have defected en masse to the Ulster volunteers or to the, the Irish volunteers? Certainly the British government has some concerns about the territorial units in Ireland, small as they are. In late March 1914, the rifles of both Campbell College OTC and Queen's University Belfast OTC were withdrawn from those units and brought the palace barracks in Holyrood where they could be guarded by regular troops and that uh, was seen as, as quite an insult to the units. Um, to show you just sort of how insulting that was felt to be. The Londonderry Sentinel, no less, I would think, you know, quite, quite a way away from Belfast, but the Londonderry Sentinel funders, the insult of taking away their arms, it's not particularly about the Queen's OTC, at the present juncture, will certainly recoil upon the heads of a stupid and purblind government. The OTC was formed in the interest of the British Army, and the service of the members has been for purely patriotic reasons. 
possibly many of the members may be in sympathy with the Ulster movement, but is that any justification for the action of the government in disarming them and saying practically to the whole body, you are not worthy to be trusted at this supreme moment with rifles, therefore that we won't disband you, we will disarm you because we suspect you. So perhaps there we're getting a sense of what would have happened had the territorials uh, been extended to um, Ireland. When the Young Citizen Volunteers were formed in 1912, there were some part-time units in the Greater Belfast area. These were all special reserve units formed from the old uh, militia. Perhaps most noticeably, one of the fears that comes about at this time is the idea of the, the bolt from the blue, uh, as it's talked about, the idea of a, a German naval raid on a, a vulnerable part of the UK. And in that context, uh, Belfast Lock is of course refortified uh, in this period, 1908-1910, we get the new forts built at Carrout and Grey Point to replace the fairly elderly fortifications at uh, Carrickfergus Castle, which had been upgunned in the Victorian period. But it was felt by many that that was insufficient, that while there was the Antrim Royal Garrison artillery that would take over those forts in time of war, that there was no infantry force nearby to support them. In May 1913, uh, Colonel Chichester, who at that point is the commanding officer of the Young Citizen Volunteers, uh, attends one of the council meetings and, as, as the report says, mentioned the defence of the state of Belfast and informed the volunteer council that this was one of the matters which attention of the Secretary of State for War might be drawn to and that an offer would be made on behalf of the organisation to supply a sufficient force to bring about the necessary improvement. <coughs> it was arranged that if possible a resolution should be passed by the City Council, the Harbour Board and the Chamber of Commerce, drawing the attention of the War Office to the unprepared state of the city in the event of invasion. So we get these ideas of invasion, lack of territorial force uh, being applied very firmly there. Last week you may remember me saying that William Copeland Trimble, when he formed the Unskilled Horse, had approached the War Office throughout 1912 and into 1913 to try to get that unit recognised, to try and get them armed and to try and get them brought in as an element of the territorial force. And we get similar approaches from the Young Citizen Volunteers uh, Committee. Early on in August 1912, uh, they approached even before obviously the official formation of the, the Young Citizen Volunteers, asking for obsolete rifles for drill purposes. That seems to be removed <coughs> fairly early on. Sorry, Stephen. Um, <coughs> the War Office does seem to have been involved in some sort of dialogue with the Young Citizen Volunteers, though, because in April 1913, Chichester talked about the idea of sending a deputation to meet with the Secretary of State for War, saying that it received communication, which meant that it was going to be worth <coughs> discussing the arming of the organisation and its role in the defence of Belfast. But by November 1913, uh, Chichester, the CEO, felt that Colonel Seeley, who was at that point Secretary of State for War, was being very unhelpful and had essentially denied War Office recognition of the Young Citizen Volunteers at that point. So really between August 12th and November 13th, it looks as if there's a fair chance of the Young Citizen Volunteers being recognised but by November 13, that, that opportunity has passed. That then led to concerns amongst the officers of the Young Citizen Volunteers, which is expressed by one of their number, Captain May. Um, he stated that the absence of recognition in any form by the government is a severe handicap. A strong effort should be made to supply funds in lieu of government grants in order that the men may be, su be supplied free of cost to them with a more serviceable uniform suitable for field work and with great coats. So you can see there are some of the ideas that had, um, I'll just flick around a few photographs or else this will pack up on this, but uh, one of the ideas obviously is if they go in with a territorial force that the men would be equipped at government expense, they would get rifles at government expense, and they would also of course get paid, uh, we'd get a bounty for an annual camp. Without all that it was seen uh, that the, the finances of the Young know, Citizen Volunteers relied far too much on their membership, I will come on to that uh, shortly. There were initial proposals that the Young Citizen Volunteers would be available for use in aid of the civil power. So, interestingly, we're not just getting the idea of the territorial force, but we're starting to get an early idea of the special constabulary, as it was uh, set up in Great Britain at the time, and of course the idea of special constabulary in uh, Ulster after 1920. But the War Office seems to have been particularly wary of this, because when the territorial force was set up, one of the compromises that Halton had to make was with the left of the Liberal Party and with the Labour movement, who were very concerned about the idea of uh, 
territorial force units being used to enable the civil power and being used for strike breaking as they saw it. One newspaper correspondent in Belfast also signalled out this idea of using the young citizen volunteers in the aid of the civil power as a particular weakness of the idea. Um, this is a correspondent writing to the Belfast newsletter saying, Concerning assistance to our constabulary, would a body of inexperienced young men, for inexperienced they must be, not cut a sorry spectacle when attacked by a howling, reckless mob we are so often accustomed to see at social tumults? And of course, some of the ideas there would be going back to the, the major labour disputes uh, of 1907 in the city and, uh, of course, the more uh, problematic uh, party factional fights that, that uh, went on periodically. So we get this idea about the British military tradition. Another idea that's behind the Young Citizen Volunteers is to do with the militarised youth movements that had been set up from the Victorian period. The Boys Brigade dated from 1883, the Boys Scouts from 1907, and if a somewhat less relevant story to make the Church Lads Brigade from 1891. The Church of Lansbury didn't really extend to Ireland in a major way, but as early as 1889 there were 66 BB companies in Ireland with 2,637 members. By 1912 there was an entire uh, Boys Brigade Battalion, as it was called, based on Belfast, and another in Dublin. The Belfast Battalion had uh, 50 companies which stretched out as far as Lisburn and Cumber, so a sort of greater Belfast uh, Battalion if we like. There is an argument that a number of these bodies were seen as essentially unionist in their makeup, and that a lot of unionist activity was funneled through these rather than into uh, specific unionist grassroots movements uh, before 1912. That's perhaps an argument for another day. All of these movements were taught drill, and most were involved in some degree of public parades, uh, gymnastics displays, this sort of thing. And the public parades we can certainly see as fitting into that wider unionist parading tradition, so that's something that wouldn't have looked uh, too out of place to contemporaries. Haldon, as part of his reforms, tried to subsume these various movements within the territorial force and make them officially recognise cadet units. That, that was his uh, great plan that you would have. The first line would be the regulars, the second line would be the territorial force, and the third line would be these young cadet uh, movements. That didn't meet with much success anywhere in the UK. Uh, the Boys Brigade and Boy Scouts both refused to go in with the Cadet movement. The Church Lads Brigade did, and in, in Ireland the case isn't any different. Both the Belfast and the Dublin battalions are very firmly opposed to the idea of becoming officially recognised cadets. They think that it takes them away from the, the religious aims of the movement, essentially. Um, the Boys Brigade uh, minute books for Belfast that are held here at Promey uh, make for some quite interesting reading. About a quarter of the officers uh, thought that it was worth pursuing this idea of recognition. About three quarters thought that really it brought them away from the original ideas behind uh, the Boys Brigade. There were some other developments, though, on the cadet front in Ireland that are worth uh, pausing to look at briefly. As early as 1910, apprentices in the Belfast shipyards made an approach to the war office asking for a cadet battalion to be formed there. Not surprisingly, perhaps Dublin Castle and the war office ran a mile at the idea of um, arming and training shipyard apprentices who, uh, of course, in previous disputes and in future ones, were to, to prove to be rather problematic for the police. Um, so that was one idea that didn't go anywhere. But in Dublin, there was a unit called the City of Dublin Cadets that was raised and uh, seems to have been about battalion strength. It was raised in May 1911 under the authority of the War Office, was for boys aged between 12 and 17 and as early as August 1911 they were being taught uh, musketry so were clearly being uh, given rifles to use in some degree. Interestingly, when that city of Dublin Black <coughs> unit was inspected by the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland on St Patrick's Day 1914, he commented that the organisation was enrolled on the footing and understanding that they recognise no distinction of class or creed. So again, like the Young Citizen Volunteers, we're getting that idea of non-political and non-sectarian. So whether the Young Citizen Volunteer idea influences that statement, or if the experience of the City of Dublin Cadets has something to do with the uh, formation of the Young Citizen Volunteers remains a little unclear. Of course, men over the age of 17 couldn't continue to serve with these youth units, Boys Brigade, uh, Boy Scouts, 
or the city of Dublin cadets, unless they, they remained on as, as adult officers with them. Um, this then was another reason for the formation of the Young Citizen Volunteers. It was thought that this movement would allow men to continue the drill and other activities that they carried out with uh, these various youth mm -hmm. movements. A circular letter that was designed to attract subscribers that was put together in October 1912 said, we feel that the young men of our country have been seriously handicapped in the past in not having any general organisation capable of continuing the good work done by the Boys Brigade, Church and Alts Brigade and Boy Scouts movement. A uh, letter to the Belfast Newsletter, also to the Northern Whig in May 1912, advocating the formation of the Young Citizen Volunteers, also made much of the Boys Brigade and Boy Scout connections. So this idea of militarised youth being essentially a good thing and something that should be prolonged beyond the age of 17 and seen as a good idea. When FC Forth, the principal of the Municipal Technical Institute, addressed the Young Citizen Volunteers at a lecture in December 1912, he commented that many of the members were former members of the Boys Brigade, so that, that seems to have worked out reasonably well. However, there were some concerns voiced in the, the local press about all this. Uh, the Reverend T.W. Davidson wrote to the Belfast Newsletter and said, I am not in favour of the bayonet or baton drill and the development of a manly physique. And he went on to note that the Young Men's Christian Association essentially met a number of the supposed purposes of the Young Citizen Volunteers. So those sort of same concerns of the Boys Brigade and Boy Scouts are being voiced by Davidson uh, quite late in the day about the, the sort of older uh, movement post post-17. If we turn now to say a bit more about the uniform, um, you can see various uh, photographs here, so I've shown you a few um, of the initial ones there. Uh, parade there at Bridge M, I think fairly late on in uh, summer of 1914. Um, and there are some of the senior NCOs. A uniform committee was established uh, very early on as part of the Young Citizen Volunteer Movement. And in October 1912, they recommended a uniform consisting of a silver grey tunic with blue facings and a badge of shamrock design surmounted by the crown. And then there was an idea, of course, that you would get more than one battalion of the Young Citizen Volunteers. So they said the battalions of the various provinces to introduce their own coat of arms in the centre. We should say that the Young Citizen Volunteers of Ireland never becomes anything more than one battalion. Young Citizen Volunteers of Belfast, essentially. The idea of the badge uh, with the shamrocks surrounded by the Crown did uh, provoke some problems. The Honorary Secretary at a council meeting asked whether the organisation actually had the right to use the Crown on their badges. And after a discussion, it was decided that, well, they didn't really have the right to wear it legally, but that they might as well go ahead and use it anyway. So, um, interesting, no, no real approach was made to the palace uh, or anywhere else, it seems, to, to make use of the Crown. At the formation of the Young Citizen Volunteers, it was decided that no recruit would be issued with a uniform until he had attained such a degree of efficiency as the commanding officer may direct. So that the uniforms weren't doled out at the very formation of the, the movement. They come in after a number of drills have taken place. And of course there's the whole issue of finance tied up with this. The uniform committee was first approached, and it, it seems that they were approached first, which is quite interesting, rather than putting out a tender. Uh, about uniforms in October 1912, and it was a, a London company, Pierce, Nasser's Pierce of London, who approached the uniform committee and offered the uniform at 25 shillings, uh, the tunic at 14 shillings and three pence, trousers at eight shillings and six pence, one shilling for the, the girdle, and two shillings and nine pence for the cap. Not surprisingly, given the number of textile firms in Belfast, the Uniform Committee said that they should place an adver advertisement in the local press <coughs> and see what other tenders they got. However, it's Messrs Pierce's uh, tender that's accepted. That seems a little odd, but um, other research I was doing looking at the Territorial Association for the County and City of London, I think she had some light in this. The, London territorials were very concerned that their uniforms might be provided by sweated labour. So they decided that they would do it all in-house rather than contracting out. So I think that Pierce's is one of the firms that ends up with a large number of grey uniforms on their hands that have been designed for the local territorials and then are able to offer them to the Young Citizen Volunteers at what's a, a bit of a discount rate. The hats, I should have said, were from a, a Belfast firm, D.L. and Shaw, um, they were a penny cheaper than those from the London uh, company, so that's 
probably shows you just how tight the finances were at the very start of the organisation. Boots were purchased from Messrs Hume at 11 shillings and sixpence or 9 shillings a pair depending on the quality of the finish. <coughs> The first time that the uniforms were worn, uh, you might think one of the sort of grand public parades would have been the, the ideal time to, to show them off. Um, um, but actually the first time that they were worn is to a lecture on citizenship by E.J. Elliot at the Technical Institute on the 13th of March in 1913. And then they're later worn uh, a few weeks later to a concert at the Ulster Hall on the 3rd of the April 1913. So in the face of it, rather strange events to wear uh, uniform too. It appears that the uniforms were issued to men on the basis that they would pay them off on a weekly basis. So that the uniforms are provided up front from a fund that's guaranteed by the Lord Mayor of Belfast, R.J. McMorty from his own bank account, and from Frank Workman of Workman Clark Shipyard. And then uh, the uniforms are issued out to men and they're meant to uh, pay them off. But as early as April 1913, it was clear that there were problems with this. The uniform account then was reported as being very much overdrawn, although it was said that the payments were coming in regularly. But the problems in that whole scheme became very clear in November 1913. Uh, there was a volunteer called uh, Holmes who refused and essentially left the movement and he refused to either return his uniform or to pay it off. And after some discussion by the volunteer council, they decided that they couldn't really take any action against them. Presumably this was a fear that there was going to be adverse publicity through a court case. And of course this is very familiar uh, from what happens to the territorial force in Britain. There are endless problems with men immigrating, particularly to Canada, not returning uniforms and then they can't be prosecuted. So it's not uh, something that's a completely uh, Irish or young citizen volunteer problem. By November 1913, just over £393 was still owing for the uniforms, although by that point £450 had been paid off. So obviously this is a very slow uh, process to try and recoup the original outlay. That then leads us on to the question about what were the actual benefits of membership for those that were involved in the Young Citizen Volunteers. Those that were in these class core units in uh, England or Scotland received a large number of, of bonuses. Those joining the London Scottish, for example, had the use of a club room, squash courts, tennis courts, and could of course be a member of, the, of uh, various uh, sporting teams, notably the rugby team. And there are some elements of that in the Young Citizen Volunteers. We have a photograph there of the uh, football team, and there are a number of other activities that, that go on. A lot of the activities are a series of lectures, um, which on the face of it don't look to be terribly exciting. Uh, you may think I want to talk after what you're sitting through at the minute, but F.C. Forth's uh, lecture on duty, discipline and education didn't really look to be the thing that would enthrall an audience of young men uh, at any period in history, certainly uh, not today, uh, perhaps in the pre-television age. Uh, this was easier to do, so that this is a lecture in December 1912, and then there's a lecture by an E.J. Elliot on citizenship in March 1913, which again looks to be pretty dry stuff. There's then one concert held in the Ulster Hall in April 1913 with a number of, of musical numbers. Um, I don't know how good people's uh, ability to hum classical music is. Uh, Ardenti's El Bacchio uh, was apparently what they kicked off with, not, not a pretty obvious thing. Then more familiar airs, uh, Clash, You Wander Down the Mountainside, Marshalls, When Shadows Gather, Trotters, Ireland, Dear Ireland. Uh, there were more military themes here, though you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, S.S. Spence, who was one of the members of the Young Citizen Volunteers, uh, sang The Death of Nelson. Uh, the city organist played Good Notes March Militar, so there were some more obviously military elements of that programme. But beyond that, it was seen that men weren't really getting very much uh, for their subscriptions because those who were joining the Young Citizen Volunteers were paying three pence a month uh, towards it, um, which doesn't sound a lot in those terms. Um, but the problem was a lot of the officers and the Young Citizen Volunteers thought that they weren't really getting anything much for their money, whereas men contributing to things like the Scottish, London Irish were getting club facilities and so on. There was none of that 
for the young citizen volunteers. Mostly what they were doing week in, week out was drill in St George's Market, supervised by two retired sergeants. And I guess there's only so much basic foot drill you can do without uh, getting bored to tears and deciding that really there are better things to do uh, in the evening. In May 1913, there was a proposal put forward by the Lord Mayor of Belfast, which was the idea that essentially young citizen volunteers would act as some sort of employment agency for its members. And this wasn't too dissimilar. Uh, there's, a, there's a thesis on the Leeds Rifles, which talks about how this is an important element of what they do. The members of the Leeds Rifles are then tapped into this whole network of local employers and a lot of them find jobs through their membership. Uh, of the Leeds Rifles or get promotion. And this is an idea that McMurray has that uh, names can be circulated to employers, vacancies look for, and so on. Not very clear how far that actually goes, but certainly an idea that these disciplined young men would bring real value to various companies in the city. The accounts of November 1913 show donations have come in from outside the unit of just £191 with the members of the Young Citizen Volunteers then providing the bulk of the finance that was actually required. Uh, the, the pen and these company subscriptions of three pence per month per month, which came to one hundred and thirty-one pounds, and there then been an enrolment fee on top of that, which had worked out at one hundred and thirteen pounds uh, for uh, the men as a whole. I think they each had to pay two shillings and six pence as an initial uh, payment, and that led to major concerns by the officers of the Young Citizen Volunteers. Uh, Captain F. W. L. May was asked to write to the Volunteer Council on behalf of all the officers, and he said that. By this point, each man had paid eight shillings and sixpence to the young citizen volunteers, and really it was time that, that they got something for their money, uh, that they'd given up the money, they'd given up time, and that what was needed was a decent recreational club. And it may suggest that this club would actually pay for itself if they served uh, alcoholic uh, drinks in it. Uh, May also was rather confused about how they found themselves in this position because he had thought that the general public would contribute more and major employers in Belfast would contribute more. But I think most uh, sort of municipal and charitable endeavours in Belfast have been rather disappointed with how uh, beneficent Belfast industrialists tend to be when they ask for, every, for anything from the museum to the art gallery to Queen's University. So that's perhaps not so much of a, a shock. In the spring of 1914 then, the Young Citizen Volunteers essentially merged into the Ulster Volunteer Force. And this was a very uh, difficult process, and one that isn't recorded very clearly. There is a suggestion that there were um, a number of Catholic members of the Young Citizen Volunteers um, possibly as many as 200, that left the organisation in March, April 1914, when it's going over to the, the Young Citizen Volunteers. I'm sorry, it's going over to the Ulster Volunteer Force. And also the Volunteer Council didn't agree with the actions of the commanding officer. So it's a commanding officer, uh, Chichester, who brings them over into the Ulster Volunteer Force. The Volunteer Council have ended soul searching about this and issue uh, an official announcement saying that this wasn't supported by them and that uh, Chichester had no right to do it. There were great problems with all this though because at the meeting of the Volunteer Council to discuss all this, Captain May <coughs> asked all these questions about what they were getting for their money turned up and raised the rather interesting question about whether the Volunteer Executive and Rock Volunteer Council was actually in office because the annual general meeting hadn't been held as it was meant to have been held in November or December 1913. So that put another uh, problem uh, into the mix. Ultimately, Frank Workman, who had been one of the original guarantors for the finances of the Young Citizen Volunteers, had to try and sort all this out. The other original guarantor, McMurdy, the Lord Mayor, had died uh, by this point. Workman tried to discuss the matter with Colonel Chichester, but reported that uh, that was without any satisfactory result. And it seems that Workman, out of his own pocket, had to pay out uh, just over £383 to clear the overdraft for the uniform. Uh, the uniforms that had been issued and obviously not returned when men went over to the Ulster Volunteer Force. The Volunteer Committee then essentially seems to have wound up by the, the middle of May 1914 
and at that point really it was left to, to Chichester to run the Young Citizen Volunteers. Again, looking up to the northwest, the Londonary Sentinel has quite an interesting editorial on all this. Um, and it's quite interesting where they, they put the blame for the merger. They say, the Young Citizen Volunteers, whose organisation was formed solely for civic purposes, independently of any sectarian or political line, have tried hard ever since they were organised to get recognised by the War Office as a cadet corps. The government, however, would have nothing to do with them and repelled every overture made on their behalf. They asked to be supplied with dummy rifles for the purposes of drill, but this application, like others, was refused. The government, in fact, practically told this fine body of young men, most of whom had belonged to the Boys Brigade and the Boy Scouts, that nothing towards facilitating their becoming an efficient force in the service of the community or of the state, um, should the need occur, would be done. The Young Citizen Volunteers at last grew tired of this treatment and a meeting held in Belfast markets. They considered what steps should be taken and then it goes on to talk about how they've then gone over the UVF basically forced into it. So quite an interesting take on that um, essential defection of the Young Citizen Volunteers. It's as late as May 1914, uh, 26th of May 1914, though, that the Belfast Evening Telegraph covers this in any way and talks about the Young Citizen Volunteers having been recently amalgamated with the uh, Ulster Volunteer Force. Carson, as we might expect, was quite pleased um, at this augmentation to his forces, particularly since he's got a unit that is in uniform and looks uh, so smart compared to a number of other UVF units. Most members of the UVF, of course, only have an armband over civilian clothes. They don't really have uniforms. Whereas here we have Carson inspecting uh, the young citizen volunteers at uh, the Balmoral demonstration in June 1914. At that uh, demonstration, which isn't one of the largest, the Ulster Volunteer Force ones, it's the Special Service uh, Force units of the Belfast regiments plus the Young Citizen Volunteers. So the press reports about 3,000 men on parade. But importantly at that, the Young Citizen Volunteers were placed on the right of the line, so the supposed you know, senior regiment, post of honour and all that. And Carson then makes an address to, to the assembled men and says, I want to take this opportunity of saying how pleased I am that the Young Citizens Corps, such a splendid body of men and so well equipped, have resolved to join their forces with ours. We give them a most hearty welcome. They will find in your ranks men with the same ideals, men with the same loyalty towards their king, and with the same determination to uphold the rights of their country. So the Young Citizen Volunteers seem to have gone in with the Ulster Volunteer Force partly because of the changing political situation. Most of them were clearly unionist and it was starting to get to the, the crisis period of the Third Home Rule crisis, um, but also due to flimsy finances and the problems of the lack of War Office recognition. If, of course, the War Office had issued them with uniforms and arms, would that have prevented this political defection? That's uh, something that we'll never know. If we turn then to the Young Citizen Volunteers and the, the First World War, as I said last week, the overlap between the Ulster Volunteer Force and the 36th Ulster Division was weak in terms of individual battalions. What is needed for things like the um, 15th <coughs> Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles is the entire sort of assembled strength of the eight battalions out of ten battalions of the North Belfast Regiment of the Ulster Volunteer Force. But it's rather different for the Young Citizen Volunteers. There seems to be a much better transferal rate for them than for most UVF units. So it looks as if something like 400 members of the original Young Citizen Volunteers go over into the Ulster Division as the basis of the 14th Royal Irish Rifles. And then, as I said at the outset, they also then attract um, sort of middle-class enthusiasts that are attracted to the Australian's cause from Southern Ireland, from Great Britain. These attempts to set up a sports and university battalion in the Ulster Division uh, don't work out for, for various reasons and a number of the men from that go in. And also it seems that the battalion on its formation in the British Army is about 10% Catholic. So it seems likely that a number of those Catholics that had left the force in um, the spring of 1914 come back in essentially uh, with the outbreak of war and with the political compromises that have been made there.
one special reserve officer of the Royal Enskine Fusiliers who was sent with a platoon of his men to set up the camp at Finner camp for the Ulster Division was very impressed by the soldierly burning of the young citizen volunteers and he said that it was comparable to the special service companies of the, the Ulster Volunteer Force, so quite a high, high praise there from a, a regular soldier. A number of young citizen volunteer officers gained appointments in the Ulster Division, mostly in the 14th Royal Irish Rifles. Uh, Colonel Chichester, who had uh, commanded the young citizen volunteers in peacetime, goes over to command the 14th uh, Royal Irish Rifles, a former uh, regular captain in the Irish Guards and had been a lieutenant colonel in the uh, London Regiment of the Territorial Force for a time. So quite solid military credentials there. Major Peter Keir Smiley, who was MP for South Antrim, uh, also got a commission in the 14th uh, Royal Irish Rifles. He had served in the 21st Lancers for a seven year period, left as a lieutenant, had supposedly been second in command of the Young Citizen Volunteers uh, before the war, and then gets appointed as a major in the 14th Royal Irish <coughs> Rifles. Uh, there's a few other CO Slack, uh, who had been a, a captain essentially in the uh, Young Sons of Volunteers before the war, is commissioned as a captain in the 14th Royal Irish Rifles. The fact that he was Sir Thomas Dixon's brother-in-law probably helped his cause as much as the Young Sons of Volunteers connection. Uh, there are a few others. Uh, there's a, a Jack Bentley, R. Bentley, who had essentially been the, the regimental sergeant major of the Young Citizen Volunteers, and he's commissioned as a lieutenant and quartermaster in the 14th Royal Irish Rifles. He had had his 21 years service in the Royal Irish Rifles in the ranks, and then retired, and then plus he comes back, partly on the basis of that. Um, two men who've been lieutenants in the Young Citizen Volunteers also get commissioned as lieutenants in the 14th Royal Irish Rifles. Um, but one of those, a man called McKee, had served in Campbell College as OTC, so another reason there for him to get a, a commission. A few uh, that had served in the ranks of the Young Citizen Volunteers uh, also got commissions in other units of the um, Ulster Division, uh, a chap called Giles uh, in the 8th Royal Irish Rifles, for example. The 14th uh, Royal Irish Rifles then ended up being taken away from the other Belfast raised units of the Ulster Division and put into the 109th Brigade, which was otherwise made up of the 9th, 10th, and 11th Battalions of the Royal and Scum Fusiliers. Um, there's various conspiracy theories there that the Young Citizen Volunteers weren't particularly liked by the, the Belfast UVF, but I don't think that that, that really is reflected by that move in any way. Simply, it showed you the battalion structures and brigade structures at the time. A brigade was four battalions, the four Belfast UVF uh, regiments gave you those four battalions, so that meant you had one left over, so that's, that's why the Young Citizen Volunteers end up. Uh, in the 109th Brigade. Also a reflection about recruiting in rural Ulster, which was nowhere near as good as in Belfast, so that's uh, part, of, part of the reason too. In terms of war record then, the performance of the 14th Royal Irish Rifles on the, the Somme is um, very impressive, um, probably as impressive as any of the battalions in the Ulster Division. And of course William McFadden wins the first Victoria Cross for the Ulster Division in the early hours of the 1st of July 1916. He's uh, one of the, the bombers uh, in the uh, 14th Royal Irish Rifles. Um, he's issuing out Mills bombs to other men. A box is dropped. He realises the two safety pins have worked themselves free. So he throws himself on top of the box, realising that he's uh, heading for a certain death. But only one other man is actually injured then. So um, McFadden's uh, self-sacrifice is pretty impressive. On the, the 1st of July itself then, um, when the Ulster Division attacks the Schwaben Redoubt uh, near Thiepville, uh, the 14th Royal Irish Rifles is one of the toughest jobs of any British battalion. Uh, they're charged to assault the southern front of the Schwaben Redoubt. Uh, sort of falls, the uh, historian of the Ulster Division says they were literally mown down in the attack. It's a little hard to work out uh, casualty figures, um, particularly I don't know if many of you have tried much of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission website, but it's difficult to get a return for an entire battalion there. But it looks as if something like 200 members of the battalion were killed in action, many more uh, wounded. So. The, the experience there is, is pretty uh, crippling. And the reinforcement of the 14th Royal Irish Rifles after the Battle of Somme doesn't lead to a particularly happy state of affairs. 
Major General Oliver Nugent, who was commanding the Ulster Division, decided to disband the battalion in February 1918. There was a reorganisation of the British Army as a whole at that point, which meant that brigades went down from four battalions to three. Now, the 14th Royal Irish Rifles wasn't the most junior battalion in the division, but Nugent was quite keen to uh, have it disbanded. He wasn't particularly impressed with the battalion at that point, and in December 1917, had sent out his concerns to the Adjutant General, saying that he felt the battalion was now poor stuff, either as workers or fighters, and had been a constant source of worry. He basically felt the reinforcements and replacements. Um, hadn't really bonded terribly well with what was left uh, of the battalion that had served and so on. Beyond that, the sort of first world war experience of the, the young citizen volunteers isn't very clear. There are some rather curious entries in the account books here at Prony which suggest that there was an attempt to raise um, a young citizen volunteer sort of home defence unit, uh, probably as part of the volunteer training corps that I mentioned briefly last week. Uh, there seems to have been something that existed from October 14 to September 15. Uh, enrolment fees are collected again. Uh, that would suggest that uh, possibly something like 50, 60 men were involved in this unit. Uh, but after September 15, that seems to, to go into abeyance. Post-war, a few things worth, worth mentioning very briefly. Um, in 1919, May 1919, there was a proposal by uh, David Lowry, uh, a senior uh, business figure in Belfast, to reform the Young Citizen Volunteers. He wrote to Edward Carson, uh, raising the, the, the issue of reforming them, essentially in the context of uh, the then uh, growing problems involved in the, the Anglo-Irish War. Um, Carson seems to have been fairly lukewarm about all that and agreed to approach Dublin Castle. Dublin Castle weren't very keen to take on this body. Um, and again, perhaps not a surprise when you see the difficulty that there was in setting up the Ulster Special Constabulary, um, the concerns that the uh, GMC in Ireland had about that formation, the, the fact that the Young Citizen Volunteers weren't reformed perhaps isn't much of a surprise. I suppose our story uh, for the original Young Civils and Volunteers probably ends fairly neatly where it began um, in Belfast City Hall on the 1st of July 1924. The, the famous statue of the Young Civils and Volunteer soldier is unveiled there on the East Staircase. I'm sure many of you have seen it in, in tours of the City Hall, and that's very appropriately unveiled by Colonel Chichester's widow. So I'll end it there for.